Okay, what was it like growing up? Well, I come from a big family. There were five brothers and two sisters. Uh, so including my mom and dad, it was a family of nine. Uh, we lived in a working class area, a place where most people uh, who actually did graduate from our high school, uh, they ended up working in the surrounding factories around our house. Uh, in fact, I myself ended up uh, working in a nearby plywood factory immediately after high school. Uh, I just want to make it clear that it wasn't a sad situation for me, and it wasn't tragic. It was just, uh, it was normal and expected of most kids in my neighborhood to do that kind of thing. So I fit right in. What kept my family together? Well, uh, my father and mother are, first off, deeply religious, even to this day. Uh, they're Baptist and very, very proud of it. Uh, my father was in leadership positions, and uh, I think he was a deacon in several churches in our local area. Uh, that essentially meant that we had a very strict religious upbringing. Uh, I mean, no alcohol, no dating, no dancing. All that was strictly off limits. Uh, my dad also did not spare the rod, and we were the proud recipients of many, many spankings when we got out of control. Uh, I think that was just the accepted way, uh, at least in the Baptist circles, of raising kids back in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Ask my dad. Uh, my dad was also a mailman, uh, and my mother was a full-time housewife. Uh, later on, my mother, I think she went to work at a few nearby factories in order to bring in some extra income because my dad was finding it a little hard to make ends meet with seven kids. And I think because of that, there just wasn't a lot of extra money to do normal kid stuff. Uh, but somehow that turned out to be a good thing in my life because it stretched my imagination as a kid. So uh, growing up, I had to be inventive and resourceful. Uh, and those traits actually served me well during the military years and uh, later on in higher education. Uh, sometimes not getting what you want is a hidden blessing. And uh, it actually makes you want life with that much more tenacity, with that much more persistence. And uh, that whole attitude got ingrained into my head and, uh, and into my spirit very, very early on. Uh, after high school, okay? Uh, well, to start with, uh, my grades in high school were mediocre to bad. I think I got all C's and D's with an occasional B here and there. Uh, so that meant no college for me. Uh, not that I was even trying for college anyway. Uh, I ended up going to work at a plywood factory near our house. Uh, my boss was this real stand-up guy, Ray Johnson. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, smoked like a chimney. And he was tough, as most men of that generation were. You know, he didn't take no shit. But he was also principled, and he was very fair. And I took notice of this. Uh, Ray sort of reminded me of the leaders in my own church while growing up. Uh, you know, the pastors, the deacons. Uh, in those days, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, these were no-nonsense kind of people. I mean, they meant business. And you were to respect those leaders. And I think Ray, my boss, liked that attitude in me that I respected my elders. And so he became a close mentor to me at work. I highly respected and looked up to him, and he sort of took me under his wing. Uh, but there was only so much that Ray could do, and I grew very restless. I was 19 years old, and I had been working at his plywood factory for two years. And I just couldn't see myself doing that my whole life. Okay, what made me decide to join? Well, exactly what I just said. Uh, I couldn't see myself milling plywood with sawdust kicking up in my face for my whole life. It was as simple as that. Uh, my oldest brother had already, in fact, joined the military years earlier. Uh, he was stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and he'd call home every now and then. Uh, my mom would usually talk to him, but sometimes I'd pick up the phone and we'd get to talking. And that's how the whole idea of me joining the military really got into my head. I told him that I was getting bored of the plywood factory and that I was actually considering becoming a medic in the Army Reserves. And he said, screw that. He actually used the word with an F in it, but we'll, we'll bypass that. He said, screw that. Tell them to also give you airborne school. Of course, my older brother didn't think that I was that serious. Uh, so when he called again a few weeks later, I told him that I actually went to see the recruiter, and he got really excited. He said, go back right now and tell them that you do not want to be an Army Reserve medic anymore. Tell them that you want to be a Special Forces medic instead. 
And I said, what's that? That's the Green Berets, you idiot. And I got really nervous and I said, um, do you think I can do that kind of stuff? And like the great big brother that he was and still is, he said, listen, little brother, you can do anything you put your mind to. Of course you can do it. And I believe in you. You can do this. You just had to concentrate real hard and put your mind to it. And so I went back and asked for a special forces medic and they gave me a bunch of written tests. And I think with my scores, I barely made it in. Uh, however, when I went down to the induction station, that was a totally different story. I went down to get sworn in and all, which is uh, when they also go over your contract one last time. And the recruiters downtown said, you know, we know that we initially gave you a contract for special forces, but those seats are all filled up now. Uh, what we can do is instead give you the 82nd Airborne. Uh, you still get airborne school and you still get to be on Fort Bragg. What do you say? Is it a deal? Now, my brother had warned me of this trick. I say this because my older brother himself had gone through the exact same song and dance years before. Because my older brother Rick had actually wanted to become Special Forces and they railroaded him out of it in the exact same way they were doing it to me. Uh, so uh, Rick coached me on what exactly to say if this ever happened. So uh, I told him what Rick told me to say. I said, no, thank you. I'm not taking any of this. This is bullshit. And uh, you did this to my older brother and you're not going to do it to me. I'm out of here. The deal's off. See you later. And I walked out. And as I was walking out, the recruiter caught me at the door and said, hold on, come back. Let's see what we can do. And we walked back to his office where he convened with some of the other recruiters in the back and they made some phone calls or something. And after some time, one of them came out and said, okay, we called Fort Bragg and they have a seat for you, which I don't know if it's bullshit or not. <laughs> but that's how my tenure in special ops started. What was the military like for me? Well, uh, the military was like a second chance for me. You know, I hadn't performed too well in high school and I wasn't about to squander this opportunity as well. <laughs> and I did not want to go back to the plywood factory. <laughs> so that's how I approached it. It wasn't with romantic visions of self-glory. It was actually very pragmatic. Uh, I also wasn't going in as a John Wayne badass, and that wasn't my mentality at all. Again, I wanted to work hard, focus on the task at hand, and just make the cut. And I think that saved my ass big time, because a lot of folks who go into this line of work as a John Wayne badass... Uh, they get washed out and they get eliminated pretty early on because that's the wrong mindset in the first place. It really is. Uh, it's nerve wracking, you know, going from one training module to the next, one evolution to the next, and really not knowing whether you're going to pass or fail. And then you see person after person after person wash out and fail, and it, it really messes with your mind. Uh, once you get to group, it's a totally different story. You're accepted, you're part of a detachment, but before that... <laughs> All bets are off. You're just another trainee, another number to them. And, and really, nobody cares or invests that much into what's going on in your little head. So you, you have to deal with this extreme uncertainty all on your own. And, and you really find out real quickly uh, just what you're made of inside. At the same time, uh, no man is an island. And you need some type of support system, no matter who you are. Uh, and it was because of this that I spend a lot of time with my older brother, who was literally stationed down the street on our Dens Road uh, at the 82nd Airborne. He was at the uh, first 325. So whenever I could sneak a few hours between training modules, I'd go down and see him. Uh, but that wasn't too often. But I did go to see my brother whenever I could. Uh, and those guys in the 82nd Airborne, they don't get a lot of credit, but they should because they're incredible soldiers, really, really awesome paratroopers who have a ton of knowledge. Uh, and I learned so much just being around them. Uh, my older brother, you know, uh, he's a stand-up guy. He does not back down from a fight. And so he had a lot of respect from his peers in the 82nd. And so his fellow soldiers, uh, they knew I was his younger brother, so they respected me as well and took me under their wing. Uh, and as I progressed from phase one, phase two, and phase three, uh, they were all there uh, cheering for me. And I think my older brother, uh, knowing that we came from a crappy neighborhood and knowing that we grew up without too many solid role models, uh, I think he took the initiative and became that role model for me. And I think he took his missed chance at making special forces and he turned it into my chance. And I'll never, ever forget that. It was an incredible act of uh, brotherly love. Uh, 
Uh, well, when I was around 13 years old, my mother, one Christmas, gave me an acoustic guitar, a real cheap one from, uh, I think, Montgomery Wards, which was a popular department store way back in the day. And because of that, I got to sit in and play at my dad's church during the services when the uh, congregation sang the hymnals. Uh, I wasn't that good, and it was mostly just to encourage me and to make me feel like I was part of the happening there. Uh, anyway, uh, there was this church drummer named Richard, uh, and he was different, but but in a good way. Uh, you got to remember, up until that time when I was a teenager, uh, church people were, to me, boring stiff types. Uh, at least that's how church people were back in the 1960s and early 70s. And so here's this guy, Richard, a Christian musician, and he was always talking about philosophy, you know ways of thinking about things differently, and different music as well. Uh, so this was all new for me. Uh, so when Richard introduced me to jazz, I mean, my parents totally objected uh, because it was too free of a music type, uh, and it was black music, and they didn't like that as well. Uh, I didn't see color. Uh, I just saw jazz musicians had an incredible ability to express themselves musically. And uh, it, to me now, they're like the special ops of the music community. They could play anything and do it so fluidly and so competently and all that. And uh, also, you got to think, uh, coming from a strict church upbringing, uh, this was something new and fresh for me. It was completely different than what I was exposed to. Uh, and so I took the challenge. I started completely on my own to study jazz as best as I could manage it. The only thing was this. Uh, I was not formally trained, and that is... I hadn't had any music lessons, mainly because my parents could not afford it. Uh, so when I went to visit Richard and his wife, and they lived in a very rowdy section of town, by the way, we began these very rudimentary rehearsal sessions. And I mean rudimentary. I mean, it was darn right crude. I mean, like he would lock me up in a small shack in his backyard and he'd say, listen to this jazz album over and over again and try to play along with it. And I'd say, but I don't know what I'm playing, and I don't know what they're playing. And he'd say, so, just feel the music, do the best you can. You say you wanted to be a jazz musician, right? I said, well, yeah. Well, then do it. And there I'd stay in that shack, locked up for four hours at a time, and I'd play, and I'd play, and I'd play. Of course, I really didn't know at that time what I was playing, and I was just trying to approximate what I was hearing. But the thing is this, I wanted it, and I was willing to go to any lengths to reach my goal. And so there I was, and this went on for months and months. And then one day, when I least expected it, I found that I just one day could make sense of the bass guitar. And I really don't think Richard knew what the hell he was doing entirely, nor did I. But what we did get right is that persistence pays off. And from that moment on, I would build upon that very small, tiny foundation, that small beginning. And when I joined the military, the bass guitar went with me. And whenever I could, in between training modules while in the barracks, I'd practice my bass. Today, uh, I'm a respected composer and arranger. And every now and then, if the opportunity presents itself, I'll lead my own jazz band. But you know what? I still, to this day, have not had a music lesson. I have remained completely self-taught, much like a lot of things I've done in my life. But listen, the moral of the story is this. Do not be afraid of rudimentary techniques, no matter how crude they may seem. I know it was funny me in a shack being locked up for four hours at a time. But listen, those rudimentary techniques work only if you make them work. Sometimes rudimentary is all you got, so you better get used to that concept. But it's all up to your determination. It's all up to your imagination and inventiveness and also your ability to think outside the box. You got to practice it. What was higher education like for me? Okay, wow, we're really switching gears here. Uh, the only reason I made it through higher education is because the military taught me how to think and act. Uh, the military taught me how to cut through the bullshit and to get to the business of getting something done. Um, I found out that folks in higher education, especially in a doctoral program, are not this way at all. So it was a very different world for me. Uh, now, I went to a very prestigious university. It, I think it's still rated the number one public university in, in the world, really. So it was extremely competitive, extremely so. And being that I have a competitive nature, I, I found that comforting. But still, um, I found that university intellectuals are, for the most part, really self-absorbed wussies. And I hope that doesn't upset anyone, but those are my observations and they may not be yours. So it was very difficult for me being around those types constantly, especially having come from the special ops community. 
Uh, you have to also remember that I came from a different socioeconomic background than the majority of these kids. Uh, most university students, not all, but a good deal of them, and especially at this university, uh, they've been groomed from cradle to college to assume the university life. Uh, it's a rite of passage for them, and they expect it. Um, I just didn't have that same luxury of expecting things in my life like that. That just was not my reality. I mean, I had to kick and claw my way through everything, and the PhD was no different. Uh, the most notable part for me was studying for the PhD oral exams, by far. Uh, and for that, I needed to compile my own reading list, which also had to be approved. And I also needed to assemble my own oral exam committee as well. And one of those people in your committee must serve as an oral exams director. And mine was this real stand-up guy, a professor who grew up in the 1940s in Brooklyn, New York. And I mean, this guy was an in-your-face guy. He did not mince words. And he told me, all right, you know what to do. Don't bullshit around. Just get to work. Now, the most important thing is this. You have to record everything you do. And I said, why? And he said, because this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. You'll never, ever get another chance like this. You'll never again get the chance to read all day for a year and a half over two centuries of literature. Never so, he told me, take it seriously and write down all your thoughts, impressions, everything. And boy, was he ever right. He was right on the money. And I'm glad I took his advice because that chance, once it was over, it never, ever came again. And so I did exactly what he told me. I typed down notes and quotes and my impressions and thoughts and all that. I typed it all and I later organized it into a database. And it was one of the best things I've ever, ever done in my life. I hope to share that database with my son one day when he gets older. Uh, typical day. Um, well, I would get to the library at around 8 a.m. every day, and many days I wouldn't leave until 10 p.m., so I was the first one in and the last one out. And talk about a bug out bag. I mean, I had to backpack in all my supplies for the day. Uh, so I'm talking about coffee thermos, sandwiches, snacks, and then the little stuff. I mean, the stuff that can make or break your day like lip balm and hand lotion, etc. And of course, my laptop, headphones, electronic adapters, and a whole ton of books. At first, it was hard because I didn't think I could keep up that pace for a year and a half. But the funny thing is that your mind adapts to the pace. It really, really does. And after a while, you can handle it. It becomes your new norm. But you got to push through that initial wall. Uh, some of the most surreal moments I remember uh, always came late at night when the library was almost empty. And I'd be there all day with folks. And now late at night, I was literally alone, the last one there. And with my headphones on, reading, reading, reading. And then suddenly I'd realize that I was coming to the end of an author, uh, like Walt Whitman, for instance. And I had been with Walt Whitman for like seven 16-hour days in a row. And I had read through all his stuff. And it was like saying goodbye to a close friend. And, and this is hard for me to explain and, and probably harder for a lot of people in the audience to imagine. I understand and I apologize. But suffice to say that I felt this, this sorrow when finishing an author because I knew that I would never, ever get to know this particular author ever again in quite the same way. And so after I'd say my goodbyes and all that, you know, it was on to Emily Dickinson or Mark Twain or whoever, on to some other author. And then the whole other relationship would begin with that author. It was quite a thing to experience something like that. It makes you see and appreciate uh, centuries of literature like very few can. And I'm also incredibly grateful to God for that experience in a lot of other ways because while doing it, I found a whole lot of inner healing through those very books. Well, I'm going to fast forward here through a lot of other areas in my life and get right to the analytical survival channel. Uh, I knew a lot of folks who were personally devastated by the crash of 2008, and probably most of them will never be the same. But they were affected deeply by that crash. And um, although I'd been prepping for some time, I thought, why not put some instructional videos out for my friends? And like every other thing in my life, you know, I really put myself into it and I did it all the way. And I'm glad I did because those initial videos now have reached far more people than what I had originally intended. Um, 
I think on the Analytical Survival Channel, I always strive to show people how to think and not to tell them what to think. Uh, in Analytical Survival, I always strive to imply a direction, but what you do with that direction is ultimately up to you. Uh, I try not to make my channel a run-and-gun show or a super-duper special forces tactical secret operative show and all that stuff. Uh, I think those approaches are already um, well represented in the prepper community. Uh, dare I say overrepresented? Uh, but analytical survival myself, uh, I'll always strive to respectfully imply a direction. And what you do with that direction, well, that's ultimately up to you. Final comments. Well, I'm 53 years old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, at this time, uh, in my life, uh, I think I've really, really uh, kind of discovered a newfound latitude. Um, I'm young enough to still be, you know, sort of current and instructive, uh, but I'm also old enough to, <laughs> to have gone around the block a few times. Uh, and I think it's that combination for me uh, that makes this place in my life really special. You know, I have very few regrets in life. I left very few stones unturned, and I'm still turning stones. Um yeah, sure, I didn't start off with much, but today I'm so especially grateful for that particular part of my life. I really, really am. Sure, it sucked a lot of times, I'm not going to lie to you, but it taught me to be innovative and creative. And yes, I didn't get what I wanted all the time, but it taught me to appreciate what I already had and to make it work for me. And I learned how to push myself to get what I want. What more can you ask for? Um, you know, all these attributes uh, I've discovered they're kind of rare in people these days, uh, but I digress. Um, you know, also, there's a lot of people very early in my life who took a chance on me. Like, uh, you know, my father with all his religious instruction, my old boss at the plywood factory, uh, my big brother in the military, and, and Richard, the uh, innovative drummer at my father's church, and many, many other folks that I don't really even have the time to mention here. You know, all these people helped me to develop in very positive ways. And, you know, they, they're the connective threads uh, that carry me here today, sharing these videos with you right now at this moment. Um, folks, I just want to be a force for positive change any way I can. And hopefully I can help others to develop in positive ways, too. You know, really, I'm just paying it forward, folks. I'm just paying it forward. Thanks for listening.